Hello, everyone. Welcome to another edition of Thinking Things Through, Thinking Critically in Critical Times. I'm your host, Michael Sukoff. Today we have with us Alfonso Braggs, the current president of the Hawaii NAACP. We're going to be discussing gun violence, race, and the big picture, as well as other issues. Welcome to the show, Alfonso. Thank you very much for having me. Wonderful to have you. Uh, now, in addition to being the uh, president of the Hawaii uh, NAACP for the past 18 years, you currently serve as assistant secretary of the National NAACP, is that correct? Yes. And you've served on their board of directors for the past nine years. Uh, just for our listeners and viewers who may not be familiar, could you tell us what NAACP stands for? Certainly, the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People. Wonderful. Uh, is there anything you'd like to add briefly about your background or interests or anything you'd like the listeners and viewers to know? Well, certainly. I have been a wonderful resident here of Honolulu since 1992. It is certainly my home now and the longest place that I've ever lived. I've been a longtime social justice advocate, and I can't uh, say anything more. Wonderful. Uh, excuse me a sec. <clears throat> well, let's dive right in, uh, Alfonso. Uh, first of all, I, I appreciate it, and I'm sure uh, our listeners and viewers would as well, for you to talk briefly about your work with the Hawaii NAACP, and particularly uh, as that work might relate to issues like race, racism, violence, economic inequality, poverty, discrimination, or any other issue that you'd, you'd like to focus on? Okay, yeah, so uh, currently in 2022, uh, some of our more prevalent focus obviously is elections. Uh, just really making sure that underrepresented groups are actively engaged, that their voice is heard and respected, and we intend to do that collaboratively with other uh, African-American organizations here on the islands, uh, to hold uh, candidates forums, engage the candidates directly, also ensure there's increase in voter registration and awareness. Uh, mm -hmm. We are also addressing mental health in the Black community. It's a an unrecognized or it's a, a hidden traumatic issue that we really need to address in this day and age. And uh, also youth health is a critical issue for us this day, such as juvenile diabetes. Uh, we've been doing workshops and such to kind of bring a focus to that. And obviously we've got ongoing civil rights issues that we are currently and continuously engaging. I see. Uh, let's dig a little bit deeper here. Um, why is it that um, you and your organization are so interested in working on these issues such as elections, uh, mental health, and just the state of the Black community on, on Oahu and nationally as well? So let me uh, reframe the question just a bit. Sure. We are an organization that is committed to civil rights of all individuals and the human rights and those rights being protected as they are inferred in uh, and guaranteed within the Constitution. Uh, since 1909, uh, we have been in this fight and we have championed a number of causes. And so uh, we are engaged primarily in elections because the right of an individual in America to vote is one of the most treasured rights and must be protected and it cannot be taken for granted. So our advocacy uh, is to ensure that even the very least of those underrepresented populations, particularly uh, communities of color, are uh, fully engaged and that their voice is heard and that their rights are protected. Okay, uh, I'm going to uh, push you again on this a little bit, and I, I apologize if maybe uh, I'm not asking the right questions, but go ahead. Why is it so important, if you do believe it's so important, for 
African Americans, people in the black community to exercise the right to vote? Well, I'll, I'll be a little constitutional here for a moment and tell you and our audience that we have not always had the right to vote. Uh, when this country first organized, uh, the people who believed that they had the right to vote and make decisions were uh, Caucasian males. And so, thankfully, a few amendments to the Constitution have given uh, men of color and women the right to vote. And even after those, uh, there has been a tumultuous struggle to preserve that right. Uh, we uh, managed to make certain uh, earmarks uh, in the 1965 uh, Voting Rights Act after a long struggle, and uh, we continue. We thought that we had some protections. However, Title uh, Five or uh, Section Five of that Voting Rights Act was gutted out through a Supreme Court decision, and now we are in a very vulnerable situation with states making certain uh, provisions that in our uh, perspective is uh, disparate and actually violate and deny or disenfranchise not only African-Americans, but people of color, uh, some of our seniors uh, and others, that opportunity to have an equal opportunity in the voting process. So I hope that's a little more definitive as to why it is that the NAACP is unconditionally committed to the fight for voting rights and their protections. Thank you. Um, now I'd like to move our conversation to a slightly different topic, but before I do that, let me just say that uh, a lot of the issues that we are and will be talking about are connected. I mean, that's my, that's the belief of, of this host. Um, and um, so, uh, as you, as you know, because we've talked before, uh, before we've gone on air here, uh, I'm very interested in your perspective on the mass shootings that have been taking place in this country. Um, in particular, the mass shooting that occurred just this past weekend, the July 4th weekend in Highland Park, Illinois, the earlier school massacre in Uvalde, Texas on May 24th, and the May 14th shooting at a supermarket in a predominantly black neighborhood of Buffalo, New York. Now, I realize it's a big segue to go from talking about voting rights to these issues. But I'm wondering uh, how you would see these issues, these these mass shootings, and the whole problem of gun violence, and uh, particularly the the killing of of African Americans, whether it's by police or by people who just decide to pick up a gun and and shoot somebody else. What's the relationship between these kinds of social social problems, and I consider them deep social problems, and the right to vote? Well, let me. I, I'm glad that you asked that question, and I will tell you that, uh, as Dr. King often said, that they're irrestricably bound. Uh, it is through the voting process that we change policy. It is through the voting process that we elect individuals who will frame ordinances, uh, laws, and directives that set in place of how we will handle gun violence, how we will sustain in a community, how we will govern our neighborhoods and the rights and, and who makes decisions and everything. So that's why the voting piece is, is very, very uh, important here. As it relates to this recent series of um, mass shootings and certainly a uh, loss, tragic loss of human lives, it's extremely troubling uh, for everyone. It is even more traumatic for uh, people of color and communities, particularly black communities, where there is a disproportionate a uh, population of individuals that are ill affected. And so many of these just did not have to happen. 
And uh, so we're noticing an increase in these types of hate crimes against communities of colors, against blacks, against Asians and others. And the interesting thing here, and this is not just a platitude uh, here, but hate is not a respecter of color, race, gender, or age, and or economics. And so one of the things that, that we believe is that there has to be immediate, comprehensive gun legislation that addresses the protection of human rights, the protections of uh, citizens' rights, as well as basic protections of American citizens and the people who stand within her shores. And so I think that the issue for me, uh, or at least from my vintage point, is this. Individuals in the policy making decision are too caught up in the politicalization of things rather than their commitment to preserve and protect the individuals who place them in office. And so I think that you have to kind of remove yourself from the politics and invest yourself in that commitment to help preserve a more perfect union as the framers of the constitution suggested. That's how okay. I Thank you very much. Um, how can, how can a, someone who's either in elective office or running for elective office remove themselves from politics. And what I'm getting at here, because I think your point is very well taken, is our political system is set up such that money and power buy access. They buy media time, they buy campaign contributions. The whole system, the way I see it, is, is, is distorted by, by money and power so that anybody who even thinks about running for elective office, except perhaps a very local elective office that doesn't require huge funds, it doesn't require huge commercial time advertising, uh, anybody besides a person like that, who's on the, the uh, even the state or the national level, uh, th they are forced to play the game the way it's already been set up. So I'm wondering, apropos of what you said, how we could get to a point in this country where people who run for elective office, and it could be ordinary citizens, could separate themselves from politics when politics is so deeply intertwined with money and power. What are your thoughts that, about that? Yes, I think that individuals, have to make a, a conscious decision to truly represent the people that elected them. And we're seeing some individuals who are willing to run without uh, big corporate donations. Uh, they're individuals who are willing to run that don't choose to be a part of a primary party. Uh, unfortunately, systemically here, we have indentured our future uh, to political parties and systems rather than individuals who dedicated themselves to the best interest of humankind. And so now they become influenced by that opportunity to live a certain lifestyle based on those particular uh, powerful positions. Mm -hmm. And until we change that dynamics, we are victims of that systemic uh, issue. However, as the purse holder, as the individual voter, we have the final say. And so I think the first thing that we do is accountability. We cannot just vote. We have to hold the people we elect in office accountable for the decisions they're making. We also have to have the moral courage to step up and say that perhaps our parliamentary process needs a bit revising. In other words, uh, there are some things like line item veto or single item laws or, or bills that would preclude uh, pork loading, 
they would preclude stacking on things that we know that we um that a in other words, the bill is being manipulated by someone's agenda. Let's just say uh, we know that we're going to defend, uh, that we're going to fund the defense appropriations bill. So we will put something in there that we know is not popular, and yet it will ride. It will make it out. And we call ourselves servants of the community. And that's not the case. So I think that there are some the several things that we could do, and we just need to hold the elected individuals accountable. And we need to probably take a hard look at term limits because individuals who feel themselves vested long term, I mean, that's kind of why we got away from this, the monarchy system was because until someone died in office, you know, or in the seat, they made the final decision. So I think that there's things that people have to engage in order to make the change. Okay, so let, uh, I just thought of, you thought of one example of the line item veto, getting rid of that. There's also, it's right now, it's it's very much in contention about, uh, you know, doing away with the filibuster. Filibuster. In, in, in Congress. And we've also got, uh, for example, gun legislation mm -hmm. that gets passed by the, uh, the, by the House, because the House is majority Democrat controlled. And it goes nowhere. You have the George Floyd Act, which has gone nowhere. So um, I I agree with what you're saying. The problem I see, and I'd like your thoughts on this as well, is we have an entrenched vocal and powerful minority at the national level in this country, the Republican Party. Um, who are able to stonewall any of the kinds of changes that we might want to see happen, such as doing away with the filibuster, such as uh, restoring uh, the Voting Rights Act to its full strength, et cetera, et cetera. So I'm wondering what you think. Uh, th this seems to be a real roadblock to bringing about the kinds of changes that, that you're suggesting. So I I'm think wondering, what we have to yeah. do is there needs to be honest, forthright conversations. And until individuals are held accountable for their decisions, then it, we will continue with the status quo. Uh -huh. um, the parliamentary process is there to protect the right of the minority. And that constitution gives us rights as minorities. And so I support the parliamentary procedure. What I do not support, and, and I can't find a colleague that does, is that it is being manipulated. It is the moral compass that has gotten misguided that is that individuals are violating that trust of elected office and they're making a political decision instead of a advocate decision, a responsible uh, decision. And that's why they use that parliamentary privilege to stonewall a particular act or bill mm -hmm. to keep it mm -hmm. from moving forward. Yes. And I, I, will, I will be spiritual for a moment and says, all things may be lawful, they're just not prudent to do so. And so it's similar to the cop that recognizes that you're speeding. He can use his judgment as to whether or not to issue a ticket, or he can have a conversation with you and send you on your way. And I think that if we had more members of Congress who were willing to get into some John Lewis good trouble and make a moral decision about the way forward for this country, we would be in a better position. And that takes a huge step for some of these individuals who are truly vested. And that's why I think term limits uh, are one of those means by which they can't become too encumbered in those privileges that allow them to disregard their constituents back home. Uh, I'd like to... Uh refocus our conversation now it's been wonderful so far and we're fast running out of time 
Let, let's talk about um, the legacy of the civil rights movement, if you don't mind. Um, I was certainly influenced by that as, as a young child. And um, what comes to mind, I'm not exactly sure why, but uh, I believe Martin Luther King, uh, it was either a speech or a short uh, track he wrote called Why We Can't Wait. Mm. Are you familiar with that? I don't, okay. right off the it, top of my head, not so. It doesn't matter, because I'm sure there are many things you're familiar with that I have no clue about. But um, what I'm thinking is, uh, maybe we cannot, we need to do both and. Maybe we can't wait for one of these politicians to have the moral courage to do, as you're suggesting, uh, John Lewis was one such person. Very few others uh, who have been like that, who have actually been elected uh, officials. Barbara elected. Jordan. Yeah, Barbara Jordan. There are others, There's, I'm mm -hmm. sure. Yeah, Absolutely. we can serve. So, um, but I'm wondering uh, if we also need to work outside of the legislative process. This is what I understand the civil rights movement was about. Uh, people and in in the case of the American civil rights movement, it was blacks, it was whites, it was others who created, along with uh, Martin Luther King and other leaders from the Southern Christian Leadership Conference and others, created a powerful movement that at first had to go outside of the system because of the, the horrible uh, discrimination and violence that was being um, perpetrated on, on Blacks uh, in, in, in the South. You know, we, I, I was a child then. I remember pictures of the fire hoses and children being beaten. And, you know, that, that was graphic. And, but it, it wasn't just the visual images. It was the fact that there was a movement going on right. that was in, independent of the institutions. And, um, a lot of people today would argue that that's we really even need that more desperately right now than we need to. Uh, we need to do both. We need to work inside and outside the system, if you want to call it that. And you know, just to connect this up, and I see where you are fast running out of time. Uh, you know, we had a Black Lives Matter movement uh, over two years ago now, and that brought masses of people out into the streets, not just blacks whites and others and it really seemed to be starting to push towards the change in 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 laws in in funding of police departments it really seemed to have so much some momentum where where that movement is now would be another cold conversation but i wanted to bring that up and and also um i want to get to the issue of community because i know that's something we've spoken about and that is very important to you and I'm wondering how the community is connected with with all this. So I will I will uh, kind of wrap us up here where we first began. Yes, and yes. so we talked about voting. We talked about uh, gun violence. We talked about racism. We talked about all of those nuances. Mm -hmm. And at the end of the day, it all comes down to community. You've heard me say a community of color, particularly uh, blacks or Asians or Hispanic or whomever, uh, whomever group it is. I think yes. that the issue that we're having in the world today is that we don't have a respect for cultural awareness. We mm -hmm. don't have a respect for diversity, equity, and inclusion. Mm -hmm. but we don't see a need to engage uh, our fellow man on the critical issues of the day. And so if we are to sustain, and Dr. King often uh, reminded us of this, if we are to sustain as a humanity, we've got to learn to live together. And so I think that there are several things. We've got to go back and we have to put the neighbor in the neighborhood. We literally have to do that. Uh, we have to start from a position of what does it mean to love our fellow man, to care for our fellow man, and serve our fellow man. And we have to establish trust. 
that means that uh, policemen have to do more than just drive by, that they have to uh, intimidate, that they have to engage the communities at all level, and they've got to do more of it. The workforce has to be more representative of our most diverse community. We have to be more than just politicians with nice, eloquent orations that, hey, sounds good, and there's no follow through. And we have to also ensure the future. Dr. Mary McLeod Bethune in her last uh, will and testament told us the most precious thing that we can do is secure the future for our kids and make sure that they had an opportunity for this great education. And unless we do these basic things, you know, that Maslow identified in his hierarchy of needs, we are destined to fail as a humanity, thus our community and its infrastructure is going to crumble and we're going to be lost. And we're going to continue to have all of these distractions and diversions and the very least of these creations are going to suffer tremendously. Thank you. And just, just to close, I'd like us to end on a little bit more of a hopeful note. Uh, so I'm wondering what you think citizens can do to bring about the kinds of changes or the kind of world or the kind of neighborhood and community that, that you feel so strongly about. I think that every person, and I'll just say here locally, embody what it means to show aloha. We have to feel comfortable to just say hi to someone. Be, be bold enough to ask someone how they're doing. If you see something, say something. It's going to be appreciated. Yes. You know? But we have to take charge of our communities. Thank you so much. Uh, that's all the time we have for today. We've been speaking with Alfonso Braggs. President of the Hawaii NAACP. Alfonso, uh, thank you so much for joining us today. It's certainly been my honor and a privilege to be with you, and I look forward to another opportunity. Wonderful. This has been Thinking Things Through, Thinking Critically in Critical Times on Think Tech Hawaii. I'm your host, Michael Sukoff. Thanks, as always, to our engineers, to Haley Ikeda and the rest of the studio staff, and much appreciation to Jay Fidel. Please join us again two weeks from today at the same time wherever you may be. Mahalo and aloha. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.